As SpaceX is gradually moving towards launching the final prototypes of the Starship V1 version of the rocket, the curiosity of most space enthusiasts is now focused on the Starship V2 version, an upgraded version promising design changes that will optimize many functions for future launches. Kicking off this new version is Starship 33, which has been quite busy with activities in the Mega Bay. Ship S-33 marks a significant transition in the Starship program. Initially, it was intended to just be the first second stage prototype of the V1 version, but was later converted to the new V2 version. This resulted in a unique situation where S-33 has or will have two versions of most of its parts, a V1 version, then a V2 version. The assembly of S-33 started July 13th when the V-2 payload bay was brought out for stacking. Notably, at this time, the bay did not have a door. The next day, the V-2 nose section was brought out and stacked on top of the payload bay. July 22nd, after getting moved to the high bay, the new payload bay door was installed, and two days later, the entire stack payload bay and nose section were moved to the PEZ dispenser installation stand in Mega Bay 2. This stand's been put in place since July 19th. Work continued through August 24th when the top section of Ship 33 was officially installed onto the tail section that had been moved in earlier that afternoon. It's fascinating to watch these stacking activities in MB2. They could easily close the doors for this, but it's cool that they keep it open during these times. So, essentially, Ship 33 was completed August 24th. In total, the assembly process of S-33 took 41 days from the start of stacking the nose section in Payload Bay and the High Bay on July 14th to completion in Mega Bay 2, August 24th. This assembly process highlights the complexity and scale of the Starship project. The transition from V1 to V2 design during production requires considerable flexibility in manufacturing and assembly processes. It also reflects SpaceX's rapid, iterative approach to developing and improving its vehicles. Just think, what other company could use a little over a month to build at least one rocket? Only SpaceX. Of course, this is certainly not the final form of Ship 33, as it still lacks the Raptor engines, which will certainly be the newest Raptor. 3 engines we recently saw at SpaceX's production facility. One pretty cool thing we saw was while monitoring the assembly of Ship 33 was the appearance of something new, possibly an internal change in the Starship V2 variants. The first sign is three shiny tubes running along the edge. When we zoom in, they look like small transfer tubes. This seems like an essential component that needs to be specially produced for the tanks, known as a downcomer. Each rocket needs at least two main tanks, one for propellant, one for oxidizer. Due to the tall, cylindrical shape of the rocket, one tank sits above the other. The bottom tank directly supplies the engine right below it, while the top tank needs a way to feed fuel down to the engine. This is usually done via a downcomer, which runs through the center of the bottom fuel tank, then connects to both the engine and the upper fuel tank. Interestingly, the downcomer of Ship 33 we see is completely different. Why are there three tubes? Perhaps this is the design for the second version of Starship, with each tube separately delivering methane to three vacuum engines. As for the large brown cylinder in the middle, it looks too heavy for a flight device, right? However, this could easily just be a support structure, helping to lift the entire system into the tank more easily during install. Inside this seemingly rusty support cylinder could be a thicker downcomer used to supply fuel to all three sea-level Raptor engines at the same time. Having separate tubes for each vacuum engine would allow for better propellant stability and earlier warning if any tube runs dry. This change could be related to the new three Raptor engines, which will be equipped on the second stage ships. The Raptor 3 consumes fuel faster than any other Raptor engine, requiring a faster fuel supply. This new design might be aimed at delivering more fuel to each engine, increasing thrust. It could also address issues with propellant stability, although this has never been a problem on previous ships. It seems like Raptor 3 is so advanced that even the ship needs to be upgraded to match. This is a promising step forward, showing the Starship's being increasingly refined and perfected. We might wonder why the upper part of the central tube is much lower. Remember the strange funnel hanging down from the common dome we saw last week? It'll hang much lower to connect with this tube. These are interesting changes, alongside the external changes we already knew about. For those who might have forgotten, the differences currently observed on S-33, which are expected to set the standard for future V-2 ships, include but are not limited to, first, a shorter payload bay. The reduction from five to three rings for the payload bay is a big change. This, combined with the addition of one ring to the V-2 body, results in a total of three additional rings for propellant. This change indicates SpaceX is prioritizing increased fuel capacity, which could be aimed at extending range or enhancing the ship's payload capacity. 
Secondly, new flaps. The new forward flap design is related to improving aerodynamics or control during re-entry. This will also help increase the landing precision or enhance heat resistance. Next is the new thermal protection system. This is a completely new manufactured heat shield that doubles durability, and beneath this layer of tiles is an ablative material layer. Lastly, the installation of the PEZ dispenser. Installing the PEZ dispenser after the nose cone and payload bay are stacked due to the PEZ dispenser being partially inside the nose cone also makes more efficient use of space in addition to the aforementioned propellant increase. We are really looking forward to when SpaceX is ready to test what's believed to be the upgraded version of the Starship. When do you think they'll start testing S-33? Let us know down there in the comments. While Starbase is busy, the Florida missions with Falcon 9 also have no time to rest, especially Polaris. This private mission of a billionaire in collaboration with SpaceX will be the first to perform a spacewalk at a record-breaking altitude in history. The mission is scheduled to launch early Tuesday morning, sending four people to orbit for five days aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft. This quartet will go farther from Earth than any human since the Apollo days, and two of them are going to do the first spacewalk ever conducted by a private mission. Here's a summary of what to expect during the spectacular Polaris Dawn spacewalk, which you can watch via SpaceX's webcast. The spacewalk, or extravehicular activity, EVA, will take place on the third day of the mission. SpaceX and the Polaris Dawn team have not yet announced the target time. The EVA will feature two of the four crew members, Commander Jared Isaacman, the billionaire tech entrepreneur who funded and organized Polaris Dawn, and Mission Specialist Sarah Gillis, an engineer at SpaceX. But the other two astronauts, Mission Specialist Anna Menon, also a SpaceX engineer, and Pilot Scott Kidd Petit, a former lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force, will don their EVA suits as well. That's because Crew Dragon doesn't have an airlock, so the capsule's interior will be exposed to the vacuum of space. The entire EVA operation, from initial venting to the repressurization of the capsule, take about two hours, Isaacman said during a press conference last Monday. The actual spacewalking component will comprise perhaps a third of that time. According to mission team members, Isaacman and Gillis will spacewalk sequentially, not together, and each will likely spend 15 to 20 minutes outside the capsule. Isaacman said that both crew members would fully exit Crew Dragon, but don't expect anything too fancy or dramatic like Ed White's iconic spacewalk in 1965, the first ever EVA by an American astronaut, during which White dangled far away from his Gemini capsule on a 23-foot-long tether. The Ed White photo is historic, but I think, as you know, Buzz Aldrin told us that's not the way to do an EVA, Isaacman said on Monday, adding he and Gillis will always aim to maintain at least one point of contact with the mobility aids that SpaceX made for the mission. We're not just going to be up there floating around, he said. Isaacman and Gillis will tick off a number of milestones during their time outside Crew Dragon. It'll look like we're doing a bit of a dance, and that's what it is. We're going through a series of test matrix on that suit, Isaacman said. The idea is to learn as much as we possibly can from the suit, and then get it back to the engineers to inform future suit design evolutions. Indeed, the EVA suits, which SpaceX developed in-house, are not one-offs for Polaris Dawn alone. The company intends to use them, or future versions of them, on a variety of missions in Earth orbit and beyond. It's not lost on us that, you know, someday it might be 10 iterations from now and a bunch of evolutions of the suit, but that someday someone might be wearing a version of that which might, might be walking on Mars, Isaacman said. And it feels like, again, again, a huge honor to have that opportunity to test it out on this flight. Polaris Dawn is the first of three planned missions in the Polaris program, which Isaacman is both organizing and funding. If all goes according to plan, the third Polaris flight will be the first ever crewed mission of Starship, the enormous vehicle that SpaceX is developing to help humanity settle the moon and Mars. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.